comfortable spiritually. And so to make sure we're, we'll have a Bible class that's profitable spiritually, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so you can make sure you're in right relationship with the Lord, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we are reminded that we are created in your image and likeness. Though corrupted, we are nevertheless to represent you. And as regenerate believers in Jesus Christ, we are to represent you to the world around us. And that that image, your image in us, the character of Christ is being uh, developed and we are being conformed to that image. And we pray that we might I have the desire to cooperate rather than resist in that uh, work that you are doing in our lives. Father, we're thankful that you have informed us in your word related to all of the details of life and how we are to face the challenges and the heartaches and the difficulties because we know that, that as creatures living in a fallen world, we are ultimately incapable of resolving these issues and having real joy in the midst of the conflicts. But as your word strengthens us and comforts us, and as God the Holy Spirit uses the word to comfort us, we are strengthened in our spiritual life and we learn to uh, walk through the difficult times, maybe even the shadow of death, trusting in you and giving praise to you that our lives may be a testimony to those around us. Now, Father, as we study your word tonight, continue our study on the development of leadership in the church. Help us to understand these passages and the importance of uh, this topic for the leadership of the church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you were to open your Bible to one passage that we'll spend some time on tonight, that passage should be Acts chapter uh, 20. Acts chapter 20. But we won't get there for a while. We'll be doing some other things and reviewing. We're studying in 1 Peter chapter 5. This is our study of 1 Peter. But at the beginning of 1 Peter 5, after we have exegeted our way through the first four verses, we're going back to look at the significance of these three words that Peter uses to address the leadership in the church. And it's important to understand this because... As you are aware, if you spend any time around Christianity, there are different ways churches govern themselves. And this is leading into a discussion of that topic. How should a church organize itself? And what does the scripture say about the leadership of a local congregation? There are three key words that are used here in these first two verses. The first word is the word elder. The elders who are among you, I exhort. This is the Greek word presbyteros, which has to do with someone who's older or or an elder. Elder refers to a specific position, and elders are usually older. It emphasizes in the church not physical maturity, but spiritual maturity. And I've discovered that there's a an aspect to being older that is significant in the leadership of the church. And that is that, that if it weren't for retired men who give a lot of time to this church and doing a lot of things, then not a lot would get done. That when you've got younger men who haven't retired yet and they're involved in raising kids or they're involved in work. I remember I was a pastor of a church in Irving in the late 80s for five years and there wasn't anybody in the church older than 41. And it had an elder form of government, and one of my questions always was, these guys are are, are not qualified yet to be elders. So that's one of the things we'll get to eventually is what is the best form of government. But they had trouble because of the demands of raising kids and the demands of of work to do a a, a lot of the things that that, uh, could have or should have been done. So things get overlooked, but I'm just being a little facetious there. 
Um, but it is important to have mature men uh, guiding a congregation. Now, these mature men, this term elder, as we will see, is the primary term that is used throughout the New Testament to refer to the leaders and the leader of a local congregation. The, that refers to the office, I believe. This is the title of the office. It is, uh, biblically speaking, it is the elder. The elder is commanded here to shepherd the flock of God. This is the word poimino, which is literally the word that would use to describe the activities of a shepherd, especially in the area of feeding and nourishing the sheep. And it's applied and brought over to, um, to the congregation. Remember, P Peter is the one who says in 1 Peter 1-2 that uh, we're to desire the milk of the word that we may grow thereby. It is by feeding the word of God that the congregation grows. So this word is primarily used as a verb in the New Testament. It's only used a few times in the New Testament. The noun is only used really only one or two times in the New Testament to refer to the function of the elder. And, and using a noun to describe it. And the noun, poimain, refers to the spiritual gift, not the office, but the spiritual gift that the man in that office leading the congregation should have to be able to feed the sheep. And then you have the other verb that is used here, is ep ep episcopo, uh, is related to the noun episkopos, and that re refers to more of the job description. So you have the maturity in elder, you have the spiritual gift in pastor, and you have the role to oversee and to manage the congregation, and that is episkopos. So we'll talk about those things all as we study what the Bible teaches about the church, which is technically called ecclesiology. Now, um, I didn't realize it when, I'm going to fix that right now, that when I put this on here, cut off the seventh point. There, that'll make that a little more clear. These are the seven questions we're addressing. The first one is, what's the key terminology? Second is, when did the church begin? That's very important. Do you have the church in the Old Testament? Do you have the church during the time of Christ on the earth, or is the church something that begins on the day of Pentecost? If it's on the day of Pentecost, then that is, you can only get there if you have a literal interpretation of Scripture. And when you understand the distinctiveness of the church in this age, which is called the church age, then it should elevate our whole understanding of who we are as members of the universal church, that we are saints in Christ. And we're going to learn a lot about that when we get into Ephesians in a couple of weeks. Third question is, how did leadership develop in the early church as described in Acts? And I pointed this out last time. In fact, I got a good question on this from someone who was listening. Is uh, when you study historical literature... Unless there are editorial comments at places, for example, at the end of Genesis chapter 2, there's an editorial application written by Moses. He's the voice at the end that says, for this reason a man shall live, shall leave father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. God's not speaking at that point. God has uh, created the woman, brought her to Adam, and then... Uh, Moses makes the application. So prior to that, you have description of what happened, and then there's an application that is stated. When you get into the book of Acts, you have a lot of description as to what they did. And that's because the church, as we studied when we're going through Acts, the early church is developing. They haven't been received all of the revelation yet related to the role and the mission and the purpose of the church and the organization of the church. So they are coming out of a synagogue structure and moving toward what will be later de uh, described by Paul in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and a couple of other passages 
And so we see this transition taking place. So it's important to develop this uh, chronologically as we go through Acts. Fourth, how did leadership develop in the early centuries of the church age? And what are the three forms of church, basic forms of church government? I hope tonight that we get at least uh, into that fourth question all the way. We won't finish it, but we'll get a good way into it. Fifth, what are the scriptural terms used for biblical leaders? We'll probably know that before we get to that question uh, as a result of what we look at tonight. Sixth, what are the roles of deacons and elders? And seventh, how many elders should they there be? Okay, now terminology. We looked at this, ecclesia. Uh, basically refers to an assembly. Secular used it to refer to the assembly of citizens or assemb assembly of people governing a city or governing a, a state. In the Old Testament, it referred to the congregation of Israel, but it doesn't refer to them as the church. It refers to the assembly of the nation in terms of troops. Moulton and Milligan's lexicon says that it, it refers to the community of Israel, but not it's not the church. It's very different. In the Gospels, there's only two references, and I think 1817 is just a general reference to the assembly, maybe even an allusion to the synagogue. We talked about the fact that there's the universal church and there's the local church. The universal church in Colossians 124 is his body, Christ's body. So that tells you the implication there is it doesn't begin until Christ is ascended. It can't. There's two, lots of reasons we went through as to why the church could not have begun until uh, Pentecost in 33. Christ is the head. He's the authority over the body. Uh, we looked at other passages like 1 Corinthians 12, 27, where the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, 4, there's one body. Ephesians 4, 12 refers to the body of Christ. So that's the terminology. When did the church begin? We looked at this. The church did not exist in the Old Testament. The first argument basically is that the New Testament teaches that the church is a mystery in the Old Testament. And the key passage for that, central passage, first of all, is Ephesians 2, uh, 3 rather, 2 through 5, which talks about this mystery that Jew and Gentile would be made in one new body. That doesn't happen prior to A.D. 33, and you don't have the formal entry of Gentiles until Acts chapter 10 and 11. Uh, so the church begins, and it's in this transition stage. Uh, were there Gentiles on the day of Pentecost? There probably were, because you have all the, they would have been Jewish proselytes, the full proselyte who's converting to Judaism, and so it's very likely there were, but they're, because they're viewed as converts, proselytes coming in, they would be understood by the Jews as becoming Jews, coming under the authority of, of uh, Judaism. So this mystery doctrine, mystery means previously unrevealed truth. And so this is what's happening uh, in the early church. Then you have the statement by Jesus. The second main thing to know, Ephesians 3, 1 through 5, and then Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says on this, church, on this rock, I will build my church. That's future tense, so it indicates that the church is not in existence uh, during the time of the Gospels. Other passages like Acts 20, 28 says that indicates the church could not begin until after the resurrection, Res death and resurrection that he purchased the church with his blood so it's a purchased entity uh, then Ephesians 4 8 actually 8 through 12 but primarily uh, 8 11 and 12 the leadership or communication gifts apostle prophet evangelist and pastor teacher we'll get into all the issues related to understanding uh, whether that's one gift or two gift gifts and what's going on there with the grammar uh, eventually when we get there. But all of this is just, those leadership gifts for the church are distributed after the ascension of Christ. So the, again, you can't have the church prior to uh, the day of Pentecost or prior to the ascension. 
And there's a number of passages that we looked at indicating a beginning at Pentecost. It begins at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends. It's that descent of the Holy Spirit that begins the church age. That is the distinctive for the church age is the baptism by the Holy Spirit. It is not present anywhere in the Old Testament. And according to what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verses 3, uh, 3 through 12, looking through that whole section, there's no break in the Old Testament from the tyranny of the sin nature. That doesn't happen until Christ dies on the cross. That is a profound observation, and very few people make it or understand it. Um, we also looked at objections from the hyper-dispensationalists or ultra-dispensationalists who try to start the church either around Acts 9 or Acts 10 or Acts 28. And again and again, we just see that the Scripture indicates that it's the, repl the body of Christ today replaces the physical body of Christ on the earth. We looked at the... Um, uh, that the entry of the believer into the body of Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, is what forms the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we were all Jew and Gentile baptized or identified into the body of Christ. Third, that the first, this occurs in Acts 2, 1 through 4 with the descent of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also see that by the time Paul is converted in Acts 9, Jesus is saying, why are you already persecuting me? And what Paul is persecuting, or what Saul was persecuting, was the body of Christ. So the body of Christ was already in existence before Paul's conversion. Uh, Gentiles are then added in Acts 10 and 11. So all of that supports the view that the church began on the day of Pentecost. You have the mystery in uh, Ephesians 3, 1 through 5. You have the uh, clear statement of Jesus in Matthew 16, 18, that the church will be built future. You have the baptism by the Holy Spirit that doesn't begin until Acts 2. When you look at the hyper-dispensationalists, they have, some, I don't know, they, they have this distinctive, only when the Gentiles are actually joined or you have the revelation of the mystery doctrine, do you have the church? And that just ignores Scripture. The distinctive in the church age is the baptism by the Holy Spirit. That is, uh, that's the sign of the church age believer. It is identified in Colossians 2.12 as spiritual circumcision, and just as circumcision uh, was the sign that distinguished a Jew. So it is the baptism by the Holy Spirit that distinguishes the church age believer. And then last time we started to look at this third issue, which is how did leadership develop in the early church? What's going on? Because you have these believers that are coming out of Judaism. You have believers that are primarily Jewish, and all of a sudden, the church just explodes in those first three or four weeks in, in um, that would have been June of uh, 33, 40, uh, 50 days after the crucifixion. And so you have uh, 5,000 added, 5,000 men added, then 4,000, and probably within uh, uh, just a few weeks, you could have had 20, 30, 40, 50,000 converts to Christianity. Many of them were already Old Testament saints, as we studied when we went through Acts, and so they have a level of maturity, but now you have to ask the question, where are they going to meet? You've got thirty to 50,000 new believers. Now, some of those came from other places, and they're going to leave, so that's going to leave a small number, but let's say you have forty or 50,000, and 10 percent stay. Now you've got four or 5,000. Are they all going to meet in the same place? Where would they meet initially? Well, they might meet on the southern steps of the temple. That might be one place, but you couldn't meet there all the time, so you would have to find a place to meet. 
uh, possibly there would be a synagogue where you had a large number of converts, the leader of the synagogue converted, and possibly a synagogue would become an early meeting place for the church. There is a synagogue as you come out of the Zion Gate on the southern wall of the old city, and you head sort of up the hill to what they uh, call the Tomb of David, not really the Tomb of David, but you're, you're heading up that way. Somewhere in that vicinity, archaeologists have uncovered a, what they thought was a synagogue, but then as they got through all of the rubble and everything, they discovered there were uh, uh, ichthus, the fish symbol. There were other things, graffiti and other things written that indicated that these weren't Jews. They were Messianic Jews that were meeting there. So that would have been one meeting place. But where? You, how many other meeting places were there? The Bible doesn't tell us. Now I'm making a point here because I think this is this comes into play later on with other issues. When we look at the scripture, the scripture will describe the believers in Jerusalem as the church in Jerusalem. Singular. Doesn't describe it as the churches in Jerusalem. And yet, there were too many believers there and not enough places where they would all assemble together as one congregation. And I'm making a point there because when you exegete through the scripture and you read at the beginning of, of many passages and uh, uh, many letters, you see the salutation to the church in Ephesus. Oh, is there only one congregation in Ephesus or were there many congregations? We don't know for sure, but I've been to Ephesus. Ephesus is enormous. Ephesus was huge. It would not be likely at all that they only had one congregation there. Paul is there uh, around 55, 56 A.D. He's, uh, he leaves in 56, comes back in 57. Uh, the, the number of converts has grown during that time. Uh, are they meeting in one place? Are they meeting in several places? You have several different congregations. You have different pastors mentioned of congregations in Ephesus. Paul is there uh, under his apostolic leadership. He was training pastors. We know that. And many of these were going out as missionaries around the province of Asia and, and con converting uh, people and establishing other churches in places like Laodicea and places like Colossae and a um, number of other places. So you have a lot, going on, a lot going on. And then later on, we know that he writes a, an epistle from prison to Timothy, writes two to Timothy. What's Timothy doing? Timothy's the pastor in Ephesus. Is he the only pastor in Ephesus, or is, are there other congregations, and he's just one pastor in Ephesus? You know, nothing gives us a definitive answer to that, but it would seem like there's more than one. John, the apostle John, when he is quite old, is living in Ephesus, and then he is uh, put in exile on the Isle of Patmos for a few years, and then he comes back to Ephesus, Mary, the mother of our Lord's humanity. She's buried there in Ephesus. Remember, Jesus told John on the cross to take care of her, that she was now his mother. Actually, she was his aunt, but he takes on that responsibility. And so what this indicates, what I'm arguing here, is there's more than one congregation going on here. And if the popul whatever the pop was in uh, in in Eastern Roman Empire of Christians, demographic studies, one guy who's done a lot of work on this is a, so, is a sociologist, uh, I think he's emeritus professor now at, at Baylor named Rodney Stark, and he's done a lot of work, and he thinks that between uh, 50 to 60, 70, between then and the turn of the century, the pop doubled. That's a huge increase, and in that it uh, increased tremendously, probably doubled again by the mid-100s and doubled again by the end, by the time you get to 200. So you have quite a huge number growing and that at least half of them by the end of 200, by 200 were still Jewish. 
ethnically Jewish because if you had these large numbers getting converted in the first weeks in Acts 2, then their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren would have been brought up in the faith. And so five, four, five, six generations later, they're still all ethnically Jewish and they're making up a, a, a huge percentage of the, of, the, of the Christian church in the Roman Empire. So that's, that's just an interesting thing. Most people don't ever think about that. I know those were new ideas to me when I, when I first started looking at it. So how does the leadership develop in the early church? Well, we're told by Paul a couple of things, important things in, uh, the, in Ephesians. In Ephesians 2.20 is a really important passage. And he says that the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, when he gets into Acts 4, he's going to talk about the spiritual gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor teacher. Okay? Those four. They're communication gifts. They're not offices at the, that point, because that would be, if he's talking about the office, he'd have called them elders, but he's talking about the spiritual gift. So it's built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, and that foundation doesn't need to be repeated. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Acts 2.37 refers to the authority of Peter and the rest of the apostles, and so all through Acts, at least the first half, the emphasis is on the apostles, and they're the ones that are looked at. And then we have another group that gets identified or gets separated out for leadership in Acts chapter 6. We covered this last time that you have uh, a, a huge number of Jews in Jerusalem. Some are from a Hellenist background, so they've really assimilated to a Gentile culture. The others are much more distinctive. They're uh, maintaining their Hebrew roots and traditions. And so uh, there's, a, there's a belief that there was a bias or a prejudice among those who are distributing the alms for the, for the widows among the Hellenists. So they brought a complaint to the apostles, and the apostles make a decision to appoint some sub-leaders whose responsibility it would be to, as they put it here, to serve tables. That's the verb diakoneo, which means to serve or to wait on. Now, this is important because a lot of people, you may hear people say, well, this is the, where the idea of a deacon began. Well, it, it, it might have, but they're not deacons. It doesn't use the noun uh, diakonos here, it just uses the, the verb, and they're, they're just doing, carrying out basic logistical uh, ministry to serve the congregation so that the twelve can uh, spend time ministering the word of God to people. And they're, once these seven men are identified by the congregation, see, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. Now, that's where we get the idea of a congregational involvement in identifying and putting forth mature men who fit the qualifications to serve in leadership roles. And then the apostles appointed them. We don't have any apostles today. So nobody can fulfill that role of the apostle appointing them. And the word there is the word uh, me, which means truly to appoint, to put someone in charge, to establish them in their position. So, so, but they're not doing it autocratically. They're, they have the input from the congregation. So both are at work here. And so they uh, choose these seven men and they focus on their spiritual qualifications for uh, carrying out the job. And even here it mentions this one Nicholas, who's a proselyte from Antioch. So he's in Jerusalem. Maybe he was one of those that was saved on the day of Pentecost or shortly thereafter. So remember, this is Acts 6. Have the Gentiles been brought into the church yet? No, that's not till Acts 10 or 11. So he's a proselyte. He's Gentile heritage, but he's converted uh, to Judaism. Now we come to 
a study of the word elders because this is what we'll see develop next. We have this sort of what I've always called proto-deacon or something like that. Uh, we have apostles and prophets. We have this service ministry, administrative service within the church. The next key term that comes along is this term elder. An elder is a term that tr literally means older. If you are wearing glasses now and you did not wear glasses before you were 40, then you have presbyopia. You have old eyes. So that's, that's where that term comes from. So these are the presbyteros, and it literally refers to those who are just physically older as well as those who are seen as mature within a certain group. So, for example, in Acts 2.17, as uh, Peter is preaching and he's quoting from Joel 2, he refers to the statement, your old men will dream dreams. That's presbyteros. So it just refers to someone's physically old. But in other passages, it refers to those who are mature in the organization and in the first several uses in Acts, it refers to Jewish leaders. They are the elders of the synagogue. They are the elders who associate with the uh, rulers, uh, the uh, chief administrators in the synagogue. And uh, they're in Acts 4-5, you have one grouping of rulers, elders, and scribes. In Acts 4-8, Peter, who's filled with the Holy Spirit, this is the word pimplami, it's not the filling of Acts, I mean of Ephesians 5.18, it refers to a communication ability. It's usually used, pimplami usually comes right before somebody says something. So it primarily has that idea of a special utterance that's been inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So here it's looking at uh, those who were the authority in the, in the uh, synagogues. Acts 4.23 groups the chief priests with the elders. So this is what they're used to. This is the culture that all of these Jewish converts are coming from. And so as they set up their congregation, the rulers are identified as elders. Now we get into some interesting uh, passages here, but let me just give you uh, some basic statistics on presbyteros. It's used 25 times in the Gospels, and there it's almost always related to either an elder in the a synagogue or elder within the Pharisees or uh, Sadducees, one of those organizations. And in Acts, it's used 18 times. Uh, in one sense, as an older man, uh, a second sense, the elders of Israel, and then after Acts 11.30, it's used to refer to leadership in the church. So here in Acts 11.30, we read, this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So that's in Acts 11.30. I want to turn there to pick up the context. Acts 10 is where uh, Peter is, is, has the vision to take the gospel, and God tells him to take the gospel to the, um, uh, to the Gentiles, to Cornelius. And then we, he, in the first half of Acts 11, he's defending what he did, giving a report back to the leaders in Jerusalem, the leaders of the church. And then there's a shift in verse 19 that begins to talk about Saul and Barnabas and this church in Antioch in Syria. So Antioch in Syria is north of Damascus. Damascus is about 25 miles north of the Golan Heights, north of Mount Carmel. And so this is a lot further up, but there's a congregation there. And uh, this congregation has leaders that are identified as elders. Now the question here is, is there only one congregation or more? And as we, I'll raise these questions later on, because you have a couple of options when we get into 
a passage like Acts 14.23 where it says they, that is, uh, on their missionary journey, uh, Paul and Barnabas had appointed elders in every church. Church is in the singular, elders is in the plural. Now the argument for those who insist on a plurality of elders will camp on passages like that and say, see, every time you have the word church mentioned, there's a plurality of elders. But I haven't seen anybody really address the issue that comes up, and that is the word church in the singular is used to refer to a huge number of believers in one locality like Jerusalem or Ephesus or Rome or other places. And, and these places were huge, enormous. And there were many converts. So the idea that there's only one church and one congregation, in fact, there's a, a, a heretical aberration that developed back about, about 30 years ago or so, or 40 years ago. Some of you may have read a book on the Christian life. I forget uh, the, the name of it now, but it's by Watchman Nee, who was a Chinese evangelist in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And he had a son named Witness Lee. And Witness Lee developed a quasi-cultic teaching that there's only one legitimate church in each location. So you would go to places and you would see I don't know if they have one here in Houston, but if they had one, it would be called The Church in Houston. When I was pastoring in Irving, there was one there that was The Church in Irving. You'd have The Church in Dallas. You would have The Church in Fort Worth. There would only be one legitimate church. See, this is a problem you get into. If this is a qualitative use of the singular, then what it's talking about is the whole body of Christ that's there. And when it talks about elders, the plural of term of elders could refer to, let's say you have eight congregations in Antioch, and you have the elders of the church in Antioch, then they would be the lead elder or the pastor, or we would call the pastor, uh, in each of those congregations. And so if you address the, as Paul will in Acts, uh, Acts 28, or 20 rather, uh, the elders in Ephesus, there were probably several uh, congregations in Ephesus. And so the pastor, the leader of each of those congregations would have come to meet Paul. So that's one way of looking at it. And, and these are the kinds of decisions you have to make. And frankly, I think that there's a lot of people who are, have sympathies, and I, I think there's a strong argument that, you, that can be made uh, for, for a plurality of elders, perhaps. But, but they're reading their view, I think, into these kinds of statements and trying to make it carry uh, too much water. So you have... Uh, but in passages like this where you have elders in every church, perhaps there were several men who had the gift of pastor-teacher, and they're appointing them, but there would still need to be one leader. So there's a lot of questions that uh, I think are, the answer is assumed in some of these passages. So Acts 14.23 says... Um, uh, when they had appointed elders in every church. So here you have the word uh, appoint, which is kerotoneo, uh, which uh, has the idea of, of uh, using your hand, okay? So the hand here is kiros, it's a compound word, and there are many who come along and say, well, the significance of this has to do with stretching forth the hand. That's the combination here is care is hand, and teno means to stretch. And so this is the idea of voting or electing by a show of hands, as was regularly done in the Athenian assembly. And this is based on an article on that term in the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology. So it would involve a, a 
what we might call a vote that seems to be indicated there. It's not the word that we saw earlier, uh, which was, I've got to remind myself of what that word was, kathistemi. See, it's, it, this is a totally different word and indicates uh, the, the, the idea of voting. So the other word that is used is uh, presbyteros, and then uh, in every church, presbyteros is in the plural, and church is in, in the singular. Uh, so as I was saying earlier, it, we have to address this issue. Are there multiple elders in every congregation? And is it possible that there was, like I said, if there's only one congregation in each place, and I don't think so. I think that there's, uh, clearly we can see that there were too many people to meet in one location. They didn't have meeting places like that. Even in Ephesus, where they met at, Paul was teaching at the school of Tyrannus. He's teaching during the midpoint of the day, lunch and siesta time, but, um, uh, they still would not necessarily get everyone there, and it doesn't identify that as a, as a church. So the use of plural elders with a singular uh, church does not necessarily mean that. Mean that. That's got to be demonstrated. It's just presented as a prima facie case. See, that's what it means without giving it a, a tremendous amount of thought. In Acts 15.2, Paul and Barnabas uh, go down to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders. Who's left out? Prophets, deacons, no mention of them. So you still have a very primitive organization. Uh, it's very early on. You don't have uh, mention of deacons anywhere in Acts. Uh, you just have apostles and elders. So the apostles would be those who, apostles who are still there, and the elders, in my opinion, would refer to the pastors of the congregations uh, that are there in Jerusalem. And throughout Acts 15, you have this same connection. Uh, they, when they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. It's a singular church, but I don't think there was one singular congregation there. You can't prove it one way or the other. You just have to read it into the text. And I think on the basis of what we know about the demographics, the, the, uh, uh, it, the argument is more in my favor that you had multiple congregations. And they have the meeting at, um, the, called the Council of Jerusalem, and the apostles and elders came together uh, to consider the manner, matter, and they reach a decision, and then they send out uh, messengers. So they wrote a letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren. So that would relate to all of those in, all the believers who were in um, who are in Jerusalem, but there's no mention of deacons yet. So we're still in this formative stage of, of government. Now, we come to a very important passage that we have to look at, and that is in Acts 20, verse 17. This is when Paul goes to Ephesus, but he's already been there. So we're going to have to look a little bit at the background here that Paul originally went to Ephesus in the fall of 52. Now, you might want to put that on the time frame of your own life, because most of you may have been born just a little this side of 1952 or a little the other side of 1952, and just think about it in terms of that chronology. So, you know, in 52, in the fall, Paul went there for a short time, maybe a month, maybe six weeks, then he returned uh, for a second visit a year later on his third missionary journey. And that was from the fall of 53 until the spring of 56. And during that time, he taught for two years at the school of Tyrannus. Now, the Bible Knowledge Commentary makes an interesting point here. It says, 
Uh, after he led the believers out of the synagogue, he taught daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Uh, this was not uncommon. You would have these uh, lecture halls. Now, I've been to Ephesus, and there's very few. There's a few places that are huge, like the Colosseum and theater, things like that. But some place like this would not have been that enormous. It wouldn't have been where you could stick three or four or five hundred people. And he would have been able to use this lecture hall. Philosophers would use it. Traveling philosophers would use it, that kind of a thing. And one Greek manuscript has a note in it that the school was available from 11 in the morning until 4 p.m., which covers noon and afternoon siesta. And so they, the writer of Acts, I don't remember who that was in Bible Knowledge Commentary, uh, is... Um, uh, concludes that that tradition is probably correct. You know, uh, one question I get, it came up today, uh, a lot of people, as you read through your Bible, you hit a couple of books that are a little awkward. One Song of Solomon, one is Isaiah, one's Ezekiel, there's probably two or three others. I always encourage people, pick up a Bible knowledge commentary, or if you've got Logos, which you can download for free, and there's a few things you can get for free, you may be able to get Bible knowledge commentary for free, on your iPad, on your tablet, in your laptop or whatever, or just get the hard copy. And if you're reading through books and you're going, what in the world is this all about? Then open that up. That was written by professors at Dallas Theological Seminary in the days when Dallas was still very, very good, probably at the apex of their, uh, of their effectiveness. And most of those, I know the writer of every one of those commentaries, and with a few exceptions, they're very good, and even the ones that I would take issue with here and there are mostly good. So you can get the answers to a lot of questions just by looking at the Bible Knowledge Commentary and seeing, seeing what that says. So what we have here now is Paul was there from 53 to 56, then he left, and then he comes back in the spring of 57, and he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he doesn't want to stop and take a lot of time, which by Ephesus was, uh, there's a harbor near there, but the route of the ship was such that it came south of there, and he just wanted to meet with the elders, so he had them come to him. And so in Acts 20, 17, we read, that Paul sent and called for the elders of the church, another place where the leaders in the churches there in Ephesus were identified as, uh, as elders, Acts 20, 17. And then he begins to talk to them, but we're going to skip over most of that, and what, what he says to them, and go down to verse 28. Verse 28, he says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. So as soon as he mentions flock, what's the image that's coming to mind? The shepherd. A shepherd and his flock. So already just using the term flock, he's, he's going into the shepherding or pastoring uh, metaphor. He says, Take heed to yourself and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, the word overseer is the noun episkopos. It's episkopao, remember, in our passage in 1 Peter 5, 2. But here it is episkopos. It's the noun, and it's talking about he's made you the overseer, the superintendent, the bishop, the guardian, and see the word episkopos. Episcopos, with that epsilon at the beginning, lost that E in pronunciation, and it's, it migrates over into Latin as biscopos, which is where we get our word bishop, biscopos, bishop. Okay, so the English word bishop is directly traceable to the word episcopos. And so the leader of the church was called, in Scripture is identified as the elder, but by the time you get to about 100, it's identified as the bishop. Now that's an important shift that takes place. Later on, when you get into the period of the Reformation, 
The, there are some who will identify the key leader, central leader in the congregation as pastor, others because they're breaking away from Rome and bishop drips of Roman theology. They want to get away from that, so they instead begin to call the leader the pastor. And so the term pastor as a term for the leader of the congregation comes into use primarily in that post-Reformation period. So there's nothing wrong with using the term pastor. It's just understanding how these terms uh, developed during the church age. So he's made you overseers. So the elder, emphasizing their mature role in the congregation, has been made a bishop by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, the Holy Spirit didn't make them elders. The Holy Spirit made them bishops. But the ter- what I'm pointing out here is these terms are really used synonymously, and they emphasize uh, different things. And what are they supposed to do? They are to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Uh, poimino is the verb, and it means to shepherd or to feed. And the verb is used 11 times in the New Testament. It's interesting spread. In Matthew 2, 6, which is a quote from the Old Testament, it refers to uh, feeding the sheep, literally. Luke 17, 7, it refers to a shepherd feeding the sheep in a parable. The verb is only used one time in this sense in the Gospels. I wonder if anybody can remember what passage that is. John 21, 17, or 16. Remember Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Then he says, feed my little lambs. He says, feed my sheep. And he says, tend to my, uh, to the adult sheep. And so I've gone through all of those and we'll go through them again very soon uh, as we, as we go through this, but that's the idea here. So that interchange with John, I mean, with Peter in John, is very important because there he is giving these uh, apostles, the disciples, the mission that what they are to do is to feed the sheep, and it's it it has to do with teaching, giving them the word of God, and nourishing them uh, spiritually. So that's what a an elder or bishop was to do is to feed the sheep spiritually. So, these terms are all referred to the same person. The elder refers to his office and emphasizes his spiritual maturity. Bishop talks about the function of the office to oversee the congregation. He is the leader. He oversees what's going on. And pastor emphasizes the spiritual gift and his role, which is to feed the sheep through the teaching of God's Word. And so that's what we see when we come to Ephesians 4.11. We see these as spiritual gifts, not offices, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor, teacher. Now, there's also a gift of teaching that doesn't involve pastoring. There's a lot of people who have the gift of teaching, and they teach. They teach in seminaries. I know some seminary professors that are great teachers, but they would make lousy pastors. They, they don't have that leadership aspect, that shepherding aspect that's part of their uh, teaching. They are well-educated, and they're good instructors, but they are not necessarily pastors. And same is true for Sunday school teachers. They have a gift of teaching, perhaps, and they do a very good job, but they wouldn't be pastors. So we've looked at terminology. We've looked at the question, when did the church begin? We've looked at the question, how did leadership develop in the early church as described in Acts? And now we're going to begin to look at this fourth point, which is how did leadership develop in the early centuries of the church age? and then barely get into what are the three basic forms of church government. So let's take a look at this. Uh, What's interesting, I didn't bring this out, but on poimino, uh, when we look at the the noun, or or the verb rather, we see Jesus, it's used of Jesus, 
three times in Revelation. The first, not the first chronologically through the book, but the first in terms of significance, I think, is in Revelation 17, 7. The Lamb will shepherd them. These are the martyrs. I think I uh, miswrote that. I think it's 717. Uh, the Lamb will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. That them are those who died for their faith in the tribulation. That's in 717. That's where those martyrs without number are listed. And in the context, leading them to living fountains of waters is not salvation. It's a reward for their faithfulness that they gave their lives for the gospel. And so the lamb will shepherd them. That is used there. But then the next three times that shepherd is used, Revelation 2.27, Revelation 12.5, and Revelation 19.5, he will shepherd with a rod of iron. Usually it's translated rule with a rod of iron. And it's emphasizing that authority role that the shepherd has. And that might relate back to shepherding or ruling over these martyrs because one aspect of the ruler is taking care of those over whom they rule. And so that's looking at it from the positive side as he's caring for these martyrs and rewarding them, just as in the ancient world, the leader of a city would be the one who would reward the athletes who won the athletic competitions. So there's, there's a connection there. The noun that I talked about in the, uh, uh, for pastor, poimino, uh, is used 18 times in the New Testament, but 13 times in the Gospel, it refers to a literal shepherd. It's only used two times in the epistles, and once in Hebrew and once in 1 Peter for Jesus Christ, and only one time, one time in Ephesians 4:11, for the spiritual gift in the church. So uh, when we look at all of that, the term that's primarily used is elder, second bishop, and then third, pastor. That doesn't mean, I'm not saying it's wrong to use the term pastor, I think it's just fine, but you have to understand what's going on here so you interpret it properly. In the early church, you had the development of something called the monarchical bishop. The monarchical bishop. This means one bishop, the, the, they began bef probably before the end of the first century to distinguish Unlike the scriptures that we've gone over, by the end of the first century, they began to distinguish the role of the elder from the bishop, okay? Now, part of the problem is that if you come along and want to take the position that, see, they're already departing from the scripture, that's awfully early to just be flagrantly departing from the Scripture. Uh, I think a case can be made, although strict, strict uh, literalists may say, no, 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 you can't really do that, that's just supposition. Well, a lot of this is supposition because we just don't have a lot of hardcore evidence. But there's clearly by 100 you have a one-leader model in the church of, this, uh, uh, of the monarchical bishop. What happens in the next few years between about 100 and 150 is that if you have, let's say you go to Antioch and you have one, you have a bishop over each church, then they will develop another position over the bishops of our pastors, we would say, of all those congregations and that would become the archbishop. And now you're seeing the development of what is known as the Episcopal form of government. And it, it gradually developed. It developed for a couple of reasons. One was in terms of the heresies that are coming up. A second was in terms of people who were claiming that certain books of the uh, letters that were circulating or whatever that were claimed to be scripture were not. And so it's a matter of establishing the authority and the uh, doctrinal orthodoxy of local congregations. So this idea of one leader in the con congregation dominates from 100 
approximately 100, until the 16th century, early 16th century is the Protestant Reformation. But let me just read some quotes to you from some early church fathers. Now, Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. John the Apostle uh, taught him, trained him. Polycarp wrote an epistle to the Philippians uh, that we have. Usually you can buy a collection called the Apostolic Fathers. And he says in there, in um, 5.3, he says, Therefore it is necessary to refrain from all these things, being subject to the presbyters and deacons as to God in Christ. So he's, he's writing right at the end of the first century, and for him he sees presbyters or elders and deacons. That's all he, he sees in the church. He's the last one that doesn't distinguish bishops from elders that we know. We don't have a lot, okay? So we just have a few, uh, a few things that address, address this. He differs from 1 Timothy 3. We'll get into this. When you get into 1 Timothy 3, it starts off and gives qualifications for the elder in the first six or seven verses. And it's a singular noun elder and singular verbs. And then from verse 8 on, it talks about deacons. But the deacon, the noun is plural. So there's one singular elder the qualifications for the elder, and then there's qualifications for the deacons, and we'll look at that when, when we get there. But Polycarp differs from that language in that he refers to elders as plural and deacons as plural. Then we have Ignatius, and Ignatius is born in 35. He gets saved sometime in the 60s, we believe, and he it becomes the third bishop of Antioch. So that tells us from our er earliest knowledge that before he becomes the third bishop of Antioch, which is around 100, not long after Polycarp wrote, the leader of the church in Antioch is called the bishop. And he succeeds, he's like two successors from Peter. Uh, according to church tradition. So this shows that the idea of a single bishop is already in place very early. It could precede 100. We know that's approximately when this is written, but the implication is that it would have already developed prior, uh, prior to that. And then we have, uh, I want to read some quotes to you from, the, from his epistle to the Ephesians because it describes a single leader. It describes a, a single leader, a bishop, and a council of elders and deacons. He's got those three going on here. In, in, his, in Ephesians 1, 2 of his epistle, he says, I received your whole congregation in the name of God in the person of Onesimus. This is not necessarily the Onesimus of, of, um, of uh, Philemon. It was a common name, so we don't necessarily make that connection, although some people try to do that. I received your whole congregation in the name of God and the person of Onesimus. Onesimus came in. Uh, Ignatius was, was taken to Rome where he was martyred, and Onesimus goes to Rome to visit him. He says, a man of inexpressible love and who is your bishop, singular, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you love him, singular, and all of you to resemble him, singular, for blessed is the one who has graciously granted you who are worthy to obtain such a bishop, singular. In the second chapter, he says, I desire him to stay for your, on for your honor and the bishops. To two, therefore it is fitting in every way to glorify Jesus Christ who has glorified you so that you having been put into proper condition in one act of obedience and being subject to the bishop and to the council of elders. You may be sanctified in every way. See, what we're showing here is the, the description of how this developed. I'm not saying that this is authoritative in the sense of scripture, but we're seeing very, very, very early in the church, just within 
a, a few years of the death of the Apostle John and maybe even uh, overlapping the development of leadership. And, and my belief is that we don't have a precise uh, organizational chart laid out in Scripture. What we do is have general principles of leadership. You have to have a leader. You have to have some men who are spiritually mature to take care of things that the, the, the leader, the pastor, uh, doesn't have time to because he's, he's uh, shepherding the sheep. And you have to have also men who take care of the finances and the building and the logistical needs. Now you can mix those together, which is what happens in a Baptist form of government where you have a single leader and then you just have a deacon board and everything's subsumed there. Others want to break everything up and have elders and deacons and a pastor. We'll talk about those different forms later on. But in my opinion, I don't care what you call them, okay? As long as you have one person who's the visionary, the leader of the congregation, you have others who are taking care of a lot of personal ministry within the congregation and others who are taking care of, you know, the physical logistics. And they've been called different things. And I've been a pastor in a church with every kind of government. And the bottom line is, if you don't have leaders that are spiritually mature, you're going to have problems. And in some cases, real problems. And if you have men who are spiritually mature, they're taking care of all of these functions and everything runs smoothly and great. And I don't get all wrapped around the axle over what you call people. It's the function that matters. So what we have here with Ignatius is showing uh, just how he saw things. In the fourth chapter, he says, um, it's fitting for you to run together in harmony with the mind of the bishop, which indeed you also do for your council of elders which is worthy of the name and worthy of God, and thus is attuned with the bishop as strings to the lyre. There needs to be a harmony, a, a, a oneness, a vision there. I know a Presbyterian church, independent Presbyterian church here in Houston, that had a pastor who had a great vision, and I thought he, uh, well-educated, doctorate from Dallas Seminary, and he had elders who had some really screwball ideas and he was in one of these governments where the pastor is really under the authority of the elders, and he put up with it as long as he could, and then he finally retired after he took them through several things that they were doing. But it's always been a problem. And churches like that, you get these elder boards where each elder thinks his vision is as important as the pastor, and you have a recipe for problems. And I've seen it too many times. So... We've gone through this. Next time we'll start with the three basic forms of church government and how they developed and other things related to uh, practical matters related to what we're studying. Father, thank you for this opportunity to uh, work through the scriptures, understand uh, what you have revealed to us, and help us as we uh, assimilate that just in terms of our own understanding of the importance of leadership here in this local congregation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.